You're listening to the NC Food and Beverage Podcast. This episode is brought to you by Visit Joko. Johnston County, North Carolina, affectionately known as Joko, is located just 30 minutes east of Raleigh. Great for a day trip or weekend excursion. Joko offers an emerging culinary and craft beverage scene rooted in rich agricultural heritage. Travel one of our unique food trails, visit a family farm, and relax at one of several chef-owned eateries. Joko is also soon to be home to two brand new food halls. Go to johnstoncountync.org for more info and come explore Joko for yourself. Ding, ding. Round two, Bubbles and Brisket 2022. That's right. It's the second annual Bubbles and Brisket brought to you by the North Carolina Food and Beverage Podcast coming to you at Smoky Hollow in downtown Raleigh. This year, we have 11 Q chefs doing their take on brisket and 21 different sparkling wines and champagne. And not to mention that, we're also doing beer by Crafton. Hey! Yeah. And non-alcoholic beverages from Devil's Foot Beverage and Orangina. Plus, we have desserts from Bestow Baked Goods and Bold Batch Creamery. Our friend Sam Suchoff of Lady Edison Ham is just going to be slicing delicious ham, because why not? Hey, wait, do I have to pay for everything separately? No, it's all inclusive, Matt. You get <sighs> one ticket, one price, all the fun, by just going to our website, ncfbpodcast.com. So act now to get your tickets. Brought to you by the NCFB and U.S. Foods. Triangle Wine Company. Raleigh Magazine. Food Scene. And Devil's Foot Beverage Company. Bubbles and Brisket on June 4th from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. This is the North Carolina Food and Beverage Podcast. Thank you for listening, subscribing, and hitting subscribe on your friend's phone without them knowing. Coming to you from the Kitchen Studios in downtown Raleigh. This episode is sponsored in part by Spot On, tech that helps your business grow. Request a demo at spoton.com. And Joe Van Gogh Coffee, serving the community from seed to cup, taking particular care at every step to honor the bean. And now, steaming the wine glasses of your heart once again, it's Max Trujillo and Matthew Weiss. Hello, and thank you for listening to the North Carolina Food and Beverage Podcast. I am your co-host, Max Trujillo. And I am your co-host, Matthew Weiss. And today on the show, we have our new favorite agrarian from Smith Nurseries <laughs> out there in Joko. In right near Benson, we'll get a little bit more specific at, uh, as to where it is, but it is the uh, owner of Smith Nursery, one Chris Smith. Hey, how y'all doing? Doing well, man. Thank you for coming on out here all the way, you know, near in the big city over here. Yeah. In Raleigh. <laughs> yeah, a little bit different in Johnston County. Yeah, when you said that where you're actually at is like not necessarily a township, I realized, oh, that. Like we're talking real small town it, when it's not even a, a, a township as you called it. I, I'm like this city boy over here thinking like what does that even mean? So maybe like like let's get the lay of the land. Where where are you specifically coming from? What does that look like? Um, well, some people would call it Cleveland Community or McGee's Crossroads. We have a Benson address, a Smithville phone number. <laughs> it's you know it's it's a community it's, it's changed a lot there's a lot of subdivisions coming up all around us we're in the western part of johnson county kind of between benson garner clayton so i guess to how how long was your drive here to downtown raleigh this morning uh 25 minutes okay so yeah, yeah you're you're close yeah. even though it's out there yeah um, we're three miles off the interstate so it's i mean it's convenient to get to places but right yeah okay so let's jump into the, i used the word agrarian do you consider yourself an agrarian? Mm. I guess I consider myself a farmer, I guess. I don't... I don't well, okay. to, to, to define it, because uh, Ashby, our, who, uh, you know, heads the Joe Code Tourism Bureau and uh, all these things and connected us, she used that to describe you. And uh, mm. an agrarian is uh, one or, or describes things pertaining to the cultivation of fields as well as the farmers who cultivate them. So I would say that you are. Yeah, I guess so. Okay. Yeah. It's a fancy word. It's like it's a fancy it, way of saying a farmer. Yeah, you're like I'm not a I'm not a janitor, I'm a custodial I'm a major custodial. in custodial arts. Yes. Not that that has anything to do with I'm just saying, you know, it's yeah, but a, but but a farmer probably just wants to call himself a farmer anyways cuz he's a farmer. The life is more like, yeah, I'm out here and I'm 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 growing things. That's what we do. Well, I guess just to add something to that is you're you're not just into growing and selling it, which is what you do, but I think there's a lot of initiatives that you're a part of to help maintain that land and have it maybe for future generations to be successful at farming. 
Yeah, I mean, that our land specifically has been in our family. This is my granddad bought the land. My dad grew up there with his brothers. And, you know, it transitioned from tobacco, which my granddad was growing, to my dad had a uh, or has a wholesale nursery uh, landscape business and then started growing strawberries on the same land. And since I've come back, uh, we've started doing greenhouse tomatoes, greenhouse cucumbers, lettuces, stuff like that. My brothers come back to work with us, too. And, you know, I have kids. I don't know if they'll end up doing that or not, but it's definitely a family venture. And when you said uh, you have a owner, Chris Smith, with you today, uh, I, I, <laughs> my that dad's really you... the owner. Okay. It's a really a family business, so, I mean, I don't want to take all that credit yeah, away. Yeah, is he going to chime yeah. in and be like, eh, eh, excuse me, yeah, son? I might hear something about that. Yeah. <laughs> well, by, <laughs> well, we'll clarify right owner there. Owner by You're, proxy, yeah. yes, it's dad's business. What, what's your dad's name? Myron. Myron. We'll give a little yeah. credit to Myron for yeah. uh, getting this going. but uh, And so it's a family affair. So going, spanning back, I mean, you just said a couple of generations. So, right. I mean, how many years has this farm been active? Uh, well, or nursery, I should say. Well, the nursery, my dad started the nursery uh, 1980, 1979, in that, oh, wow. in that time frame. Um, you know, his dad bought the farm in the 1950s. And so it's, you know, our family's been on it since. I mean, he actually bought it. He didn't die. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, he, my granddad bought the farm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding. Well, so you're. Uh, I like this because you know uh, you asked us where we come from, and Max and I are n- neither uh, native to North Carolina, so it's fascinating for us to hear the stories. But uh, I can imagine that this is a very relatable stories for a lot of farmers because you said your grandfather was initially farming tobacco there, right? Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, how long? Did, was that going on for, and uh, at, at what point did it transition? Uh, well, you know, he was growing from the 50s there until my he passed away in the late 70s. So, so he actually uh, bought the farm, yeah. uh, not and, literally and, then. And, and then my dad finished out growing tobacco like another uh, year after that, and then transitioned to, he went to NC State for horticulture. So okay. he, he started a landscape business and started building his own business, transitioning the farmland to growing ornamental plants. and. But propagating. that happened in the late 70s, early 80s, which yeah. right, we still were having a very thriving tobacco industry, I mean, all the way up until like the 2000s, really, if you think about it. So what was his purpose or, or what was his vision to already kind of jump from tobacco into just you know i guess horticulture, what, horticulture nursery, right. at that point i guess it was real, i mean he would have to speak for himself but I, I guess his passion for um horticulture i mean that's what he went to nc state yeah. for and i guess that's where he found his his passion and and desire for stuff was more with ornamental plants and um but it wasn't like dictated to him because the industry was slowly no, like, moving away so. and that like yeah no that wouldn't have been till you know probably later in the 80s early 90s or e- actually even in the 2000s of when some of those uh government initiatives came back into subsidizing getting moving away from tobacco i think it was right. like oh two or something like that so yeah he he was uh, ahead of his time and i have to like just to get to brass tacks because what you're saying is at that time, tobacco must have been pretty lucrative for your family, you know, to do that. So that's a big risk, I'm assuming, to move into landscaping. Although now, arguably, you know, 30 years later, 40 years later, it's obviously a great, great move. Yeah, I, I don't know. You know, I wasn't around then, so I don't know what the what the finances look like. Call Myron uh, up and let's, uh, <laughs> let's, uh, let's I, patch I know him that in. We didn't grow up. You know, in the wealthiest family or anything like you okay. know. So, um, I mean, my dad likes to talk about coming from humble beginnings and stuff like that. And um, you know, it, it's a small family farm. It's not like we had a huge giant tobacco corporation or right. something going you on. You weren't RJ, so, RJ Reynolds wasn't coming over no, for dinner. That wasn't what their family was doing. It was very much a small farm, and they were renting out land to, to farm some of their tobacco. So. You know, I don't know what played into exactly why he decided to do what he did, but um, I guess he followed his passions, and that's where he started his landscape stuff and transitioned over to. Well, I mean, we are still a big part of our business, still the wholesale nursery business, but um, started growing strawberries, blueberries, and getting into produce, and then having agritourism people coming onto the farm to pick their own strawberries and blueberries and and that kind of stuff too so so explain to me because i really don't know anything about farming and, and all that but a nursery like in a sense is that you're you're 
you were propagating plants at a very young age, right? At the, so that you can sure. so that people can buy them and then graft them onto their farms or so, or like how does that work? Like what, what what's the what is the point of your nursery? Like how do people yeah. utilize it? Uh, well, I mean, there's different aspects. I guess some of our customers would be landscapers that are um, getting plants, you know, to go on a specific job, you know, a commercial job or a residential job, something like that. Some people we sell to are garden centers, some garden centers here in the Raleigh area or Cary, you know, that would sell directly to customers. And, you know, we have our own retail stand garden center there at our farm now, so we sell direct to the public as well. But you get a combination of, of other nurseries, other wholesale nurseries that maybe – um, are going to shift those plants up to a larger container, mm-hmm. and then they're going to sell them once they're even bigger. You know, right. um, so there's there's different steps in there. Steps, yeah, different customer bases. I want to know more about that and specifically about the the potted planting. But before we get there, just tell me where you you mentioned you left and you came back. What did you leave to do? Well, I left for college. Really, oh, I mean, okay. when, once I graduated college, I came back. To the farm. Did you yeah. study horticulture? At I college? started out at NC State studying horticulture, and I actually finished at Belmont Abbey College in a business management degree. Oh, cool! Well, yeah. that works perfectly, probably, and very helpful to your dad. Um, okay, so I am a uh, I'm terrible at landscaping, gardening, oh, yeah. but I try, well, and uh, and I was successful with a couple of things last year. But I, since you're a nursery, and I'm just like a very uh, underperforming home gardener to the very smallest extent. We have this weird red clay here in North Carolina. Mm-hmm. I want to know what I should be buying to plant that. And also because tis the season right now, Max. Uh, actually, if you're missing like this day, you know, spring happened a couple days ago, the first day of spring, you're going to miss out and you're not, you're going to be screwed for the rest of the year to plant stuff in your garden. Is that right? Hold, hold on to that answer because before <laughs> you give me that answer, you mentioned... Uh, I, I assume with your business degree, you're incorporating some technologies into your garden center. I also know that you have a front-facing stand where you uh, sell coffee and ice cream to people. So uh, I have a friend who could probably help your business, and that is Spot On. Spot On is a great technology company, and uh, they build POS systems. They incorporate pa- back-of-the-house stuff like your payroll and can figure out all sorts of things to really streamline your business, help it out. And it's all with a personal touch because they are uh, they have a local rep named Tanya Manibo, who's a good friend of the show. And uh, you can just call her directly. That's 858-213-7820. Uh, also, you can email her, Tanya M at spoton.com. That's T-A-N-Y-A-M at spoton.com. Talk to Tanya. She's great. She can really help your business. And then if you uh, have some extra cash, you can afford... Some really fine, delicious, high-craft coffee. Ooh, and that's what I am, hold on, consuming right here. Yes. (laughs) Chris is like, what is going on over here? (laughs) We are drinking some coffee from Joe Van Gogh Coffee. This particular, mm, it is so good. This particular blend that we have is the Joe Van Gogh Katia Duke San Isidro Honduras. Katia Duke was inspired by the magical women of San Isidro who had created and carefully crafted the roasting of the coffee to be able to highlight this exceptional quality. You can find flavors like Asian pear, creamy nougat, floral wildflower honey in each cup. So check out our show notes. Get a cl- Click the link there. Go to jovango.com to get more information about the coffee or just head out to any of their coffee shops in the Triangle area. You'll do yourself a favor. It's delicious. Yeah, jovango.com. All right. Let's get back to it. So, what should I be buying from you to plant in my garden? And did he already miss his window? Are we too late? Yeah, are we too late? We're not too late, no. Oh, okay. um, the spring and the, ta- and the fall are, are the perfect times to plant. And it's still early enough in the spring that you're good to go right now. Um, like, what's my window? What's, what's really, like, the latest I can plant to be successful? Mm. Uh, I mean, it's hard to say an exact date. The later you get, the hotter it gets, just the more stress there is on the plant, you know, right. and as you have to stay on top of watering, and there's just a lot of that transition from being in a pot and getting everything it needs daily at the nursery to going into your red clay or whatever you got going on at your house, and, and if you forget to water one day and it's 95 degrees outside, you know, there's a lot of stress on the plant, so really... So you really have to water... See, I, I didn't know that you had to water every single day. It depends on what the plant is and 
uh, the time of year. You know, that's why I like how needy they are. Yeah, Yeah. the spring and the fall is just more forgiving because you know the temperatures aren't as extreme. So right, um, and we're typically get wetter weather in the springtime. So so, it helps you out. All right, I'm going to lead the witness here. So I. I, I guess uh, I was successful at, like, I got a couple of broccoli that we ate. It was delicious. Mm. Um, and in previous years, I really wanted to plant some. So I, I wanted to do something, like, sustainable, right? Like, stuff that we will eat. My kids eat a lot of carrots. They eat a lot of cucumbers. I wanted to do that. Strawberries, too. Uh, and, and we eat a lot of broccoli. So the broccoli was successful. I got some broccoli. Oh, I always try to plant carrots, but not but from seed. It never works. I got, like, the plants, but then they then they died. I probably like didn't the water carrot them. tops? Yeah, I got the tops and everything. Yeah, and then and then they died. Um, but the I got some strawberries. The strawberries were successful, and uh, I didn't think that they were perennials. But just the other day, I looked out and I saw the leaves growing again. Are strawberries per- perennial? Yeah, and they come back every year. So on a, on a commercial setting, you know, a farmer is going to replant brand new plants every single year because for they're, strawberries. they're more productive. You'll have bigger strawberries, less disease and insect pressure. Okay. But for like a homeowner that just wants to have some in a raised bed or, you know, on, in a patio situation or whatever, you know, uh, you just leave them. You can leave them. They'll come back every year. Okay. Yeah. And, and, uh, Okay, so what about my carrots? What am I doing wrong with my with my trying to grow mm. from seed? Do I just need to? I just need to get a. Do you do you have a, a potted carrots already? No, it's, uh, carrots. I mean, I'm not an expert in growing carrots. Uh, okay, but from what I understand, you wouldn't want to plant those from seeds. But it might be at the time of year that you're planting them. Um, I mean, I read the back of the label. It said, you know, yeah. you have to plant them between. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know. I'm not a carrot expert. That's not. But that's maybe not carrots what... just won't grow in the like. Do you not well, have red clay, clay? Yeah, uh, not as bad. We're it's kind of we're in that transition from like the coastal part of North Carolina to the Piedmont. So some areas of our farm have some red undesirable clay kind of, and some is more sandy and and better soil. I so. see. Better but, drainage, you, and, right? And that allows the plants to grow yeah. deeper into and the so soil. something like carrots that's going to be a root trying to penetrate the ground. Clay, rocky soil would not be, not be good for good, it. No, I would what? recommend Matt that you just get a box, like a yeah, a, a box, and put your own soil in there. Yeah, and grow like right. Wouldn't yeah, you? like a like, raised bed. Change the change your dynamic there. Don't yeah. don't use the soil that, you, that yeah. the place came with. But uh, but what do I know? I'm, I'm not a farmer. But <laughs> but um, but you are. And then on top of being a farmer and, and also working at the nursery, you do sit on some committees and like talking about Johnston County and the things that kind of connect it all around. There is the Joko Grows Initiative, which I believe you sit on the the board as well for for this committee. Or you're, yeah, I'm on that committee. Yeah. What is uh, what is the initiative? What what's their initiative? Well, I guess. Joko Grows was kind of born out of, like, Johnston County is, is growing very fast population-wise. We're having a lot of people move in, a lot of houses come up. And um, so family farms like myself, our situation are, as people get older and um, kind of age out of farming, you know, a lot of kids mm-hmm. aren't sticking around to continue the family business. And so a lot of family farms are being sold for housing and different things like that. So it's agriculture is kind of getting squashed there with the mm. with the growth of our population in the county. It's like just wanting to express how important agriculture is to our county. That's the number one source of income in our county. And try to educate people that are moving into this area of what's around them, for one, that you don't have to go to the grocery store to buy all these things, that you can come to some places right here in your area and experience some of these things. So it's, it's kind of trying to connect – People moving here or people that are already here to people who have already been here and the businesses that are established here and just kind of some of an educational thing to let them know what's around them and I guess a little bit of a marketing you know that it, it's it's funny. It's kind of depressing a little bit when you say that you know people are choosing to not be farmers as time goes on. When we all know like how important the farming industry is to not just our food community but just to life and sustainability in general. And what it tends to be is that it, when when all the farms kind of go away, then larger farms kind of come in and they pick it all up. It's not that we're not going to have food. It's that we're only going to have sourcing from large manufactured companies that are you know doing the antithesis of what we've discussed before about like a uh, dynamic farming and uh, regenerative regenerative farming and you know like where, where it actually is helpful to change the plants around and recrop different soils so that you're kind of you're not just exhausting all of the nutrients out of the ground with this one product you're growing 
you know, for one, uh, like the what Gen Z, the younger generation, it's not it's not as sexy to be like, oh, I'm a uh, a, a, an Instagram uh, influencer and I'm growing plants. It's like, it's not a sexy job, although it's a pretty important job and, you know, can be, can be fun. When you were a, a young guy and you, you know, you went to college, you saw the world, you did these other things. What was the, what was like the reason you came back to be a farmer? Like, was this, did your dad give you new options? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was never like that. But, um, I mean, kind of, I don't really have a great answer for that. Always in the back of my head, I kind of saw myself working there. I looked up to my dad growing up and enjoyed my time being on the farm, um, you know, just being around in open air outside. There's a lot of freedom, you know, versus going, being inside a cubicle and uh, kind of constrained where you're at. So, like, um, quality of life. Like, Yeah, it's definitely you, a this... lot of quality of life. I have a lot yeah. of good memories growing up on that land. And just want to continue that and have the same thing for my kids, I guess. Yeah. And like you said, you're not going to like force your children to become farmers. No. But if they chose to do it, you're not going to hold them back. That would be great if they did. But, you know, there'd be better uh, economical aspects to do something else probably than farming. But, but you know, I think it's a rewarding thing to do. Um, and having your own, you know, controlling your own destiny to a certain extent, um, I mean, there's... There's positives and negatives, I guess, in every job, but uh, I enjoy what we do every day is an adventure. It's a little bit different. It's not punching a clock nine to five. The negatives are that you're never off. I mean, when you're growing plants, they require water and, and everything else every single day, whether it's a Saturday, Sunday, or a Wednesday, or a holiday, or whatever. But, yeah, it's a living thing. I mean, it's not, it's, you know, like when, when you talk about a, uh, like being on a farm with animals or so, it's maybe more deliberate because you see this animal moving around, but it really isn't any different as far as the maintenance, right? I mean, you, you've got to tend to those plants yeah, as much as you would if they were pigs or cows or whatever. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You're, you're on it. It's, um, it's interesting, and it's something that I've learned while being out here and being on the show, and, and it's something I never really took as a perspective before. Is like the the ownership and almost like the feeling of being an ambassador to the culture of what you do. And I referenced this before, but like when we went to Lexington Barbecue, and how like we'd always ask him like, "Do you guys ever think about doing some brisket, or would you sell beer here, or would you like would you do more?" And this is kind right. of just like the big city mentality of always thinking like, "What's next and what else?" And they're like, "No, nah, man." This is what I do. And in a way, if they did change what they did, and talking about Lexington Barbecue in particular, uh, like the whole place, not the actual barbecue place, but like all the 17 barbecue pits that are in that in that town, if they changed it, well, then now it doesn't exist. Now the thing that created, kind of defined the area doesn't exist any longer. So they're, they're the ambassadors of that style. They have to keep that going. And is there like a sense of that? Like, you know, your, your grandfather started farming, your father took over, even though changing the product of what you grew, the mentality of like, we grow things and we provide for maybe our community or so. Do you feel like an ownership or a responsibility in a sense to, to continue doing this? Um, I mean, that's an interesting way to look at it. I've never really thought about it in those terms, but you definitely feel, um, you know, some uh, ownership to what you're doing and you take some pride in that and the connection that you have with the community when you meet people, when they come to your store and, you know, they tell you how they, you know, have been here for years and they brought their kids to this place to pick strawberries. Or when you meet someone who's maybe in their twenties and they tell you that they came here as an elementary kid mm -hmm. on a field trip or something like that. I mean, that those kind of things are very rewarding. I don't know about like pressure to continue to do stuff just because my grandfather did or my dad does. But there's, uh, I mean, there's a certain connection, continuation, you know, there between knowing that I'm on the same land, doing very similar things that uh, family did before me is, I mean, there's something to that for sure. And so to get to, you know, you don't know if your kids are, are going to do it, but uh, the, as part of this Joko Grows initiative, like, what are some of the things that you can do to make sure people keep their farms and keep their small family farms? Is there subsidies from the counties for farmers or heavy tax burdens on develop, you know, land developers? Like, how, how do you guys enact that initiative? 
that kind of question is above my pay grade. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm, I'm on the committee, and I give you know my perspective from a farmer's point of view, and I weigh in on some of those things. Sure. Uh, as far as like uh, what the county itself can do, or or any kind of tax kind of stuff, you know, I, I'm not. That's not my area of expertise. But to answer your question, uh, Ashby had even provided us with some information to even to answer that question, Matt. Uh, the jo- the Joko Grows Agricultural <laughs> Steering Committee is working to bridge the gap between consumers and farming community by executing several innovative marketing projects, such as holding public on-farm events, designing a cost-share grant program, and engaging in educational outreach to support agricultural profitability and productivity for Johnson County farmers. So it is kind of like holding... Uh, you know, being mindful of like how do we make sure that the farmers are making what they make? How do we get people to come out here and do events? Maybe even coming on a podcast and talking about what it does mean. Because the beauty of of an, of an independent farm and what you guys bring to the table is that it's it's it the the proof is in the quality of of what you what you pick out of the land. And man, I mean, we know this like talking about you know wine culture and all like it's so important to have these small farms to be able to have like real flavors i mean your strawberries compared to just the stuff you can get at a you know a big grocery store it's not the same it's like there's a completely different texture quality sweetness sugar and and you guys are doing it so it's important to be able to support these local farmers so that we can continue to have quality products you know to to sustain our life yeah, absolutely. She's well, a lot better with words than I am. That was, that was good. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I just look at that and and that that's awesome. I also the cynic in me thinks, okay, well that's great. Uh, sure, that creates awareness. But how is that going to stop the big developer that says to themselves, "Ooh, we're twenty five minutes from downtown Raleigh. Land to there is relatively cheap. We have." thousands upon thousands of families moving here a day i could put townhomes i could put a single family development here like and i'm not asking you for the answers but that's where my mind goes and it's like how do they stop that because that's a big engine to stop the ball rolling down the hill yeah i don't know that there is necessary i don't know that joko grows is about stopping growth necessarily but like educating the people that are coming here and educating people that are already here about what opportunities there are available and exposing them to agriculture and stuff i mean you know that's going to create momentum and awareness yeah hopefully so and you know if if somebody learns something about agriculture and then they aspire to be into horticulture or some other agriculture field then i mean hopefully that um Hopefully it makes an impact with someone on an individual level, even if it doesn't for our specific county and our. So, so what's your what's like? What is your day to day like? I mean, are you on the farm or you you have yeah. a business to great? This business. is very different. Like on a uh, Tuesday, being in downtown Raleigh, sitting in the studio is <laughs> is a lot different. You feeling than, antsy, like you need to be back on the farm, or there's a little bit of that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, um, but, ease, up, ease up on the Joe Van Gogh coffee. It might be make you a little bit more uh, antsy. Yeah. Um, so day to day, I mean, my house, literally right in front of my house, is. The greenhouses where we grow tomatoes, cucumbers. Uh, we have some strawberries in one of the houses, and we have some lettuce. And so, typically, I start my day off going directly to the greenhouse and checking on everything, kind of checking the water and fertility of everything, making sure everything's okay, watering any seedlings and stuff like that, and then go into the office and check in with my brother and my dad, kind of see what's 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 on tap for today with the nursery side of things getting stuff open at the store, making sure everything's stocked up and that there's not any staffing problems or anything like that going on. And um, uh, I mean, a lot of times you'll have a plan for what your day is going to be and then things just happen and you just go on the fly. So, I mean... But as far as like if you put a 50% um, on the farm, 50% I'm in administration business, you, mm-hmm. it sounds like you're you're more the tactical on the on the farm yeah, I mean, part of the business. Yeah, but farming is so much different than other things, and specific, specifically like a family farm, like we're growing a lot of, with the growth in our community has been good for you know retail sales and stuff like that. People coming onto our farm, it's been great. But 
it's not so much distinct lines between administrative or you know working in the office versus working on the farm I and mean, you kind of juggle and do everything it's a little and, bit different you, so like the way it works with your dad and your brother you guys just the idea is we're all doing everything or is there d- definitive uh i mean there's not stark lines on who does what but we kind of have gravitated towards certain things i mean i do more of the the greenhouse vegetable work and stuff okay. like that um my dad kind of does a little bit of everything i mean he was the one that started the nursery and he has his hand in all the pots a little bit you know um my, and i have to assume like he's the expert when it comes to oh we're having a problem growing our strawberries on this part or we're having an issue with the actual growing of things is that accurate? yeah with with strawberries and the nursery stuff he would be who you would want to get advice from yeah right. um my brother's kind of getting into the role of more of the wholesale nursery and stuff i mean he does a little bit of everything too but um if we were kind of divvying up things that's probably how it goes with growing um my wife works on the farm she kind of manages the retail store you mentioned the coffee shop and the ice cream mm-hmm. she's kind of doing those things she does her social media and stuff my mom works on the farm. She does a lot of the accounting and payroll and stuff like that. So, yeah, that's um, a true it's, family vi- business. Yeah, it definitely is. I, and, and how big is the farm? Like, how big is your uh, your team? Like, uh, outside of you, I mean, is it like in terms of how many people work? Yeah, how with many us? people work with you? Um, well, it's kind of seasonal with farming. So year round, there's uh, outside of our family uh, to be probably about eight or nine other people that work with us uh, year round and then during the peak season like during spring when we're picking strawberries every day and the nursery side of things picks up there'll probably be maybe 15 additional workers that are that are working with us and then at the store you know staff in the store there's a lot of part-time help there's uh, one or two people that are kind of full-time during the season and then there's a lot of high school kids that either volunteer or or work part-time so yeah, it, it, yeah that's it's a lot kind of, of a lot of people what is uh and sorry i just i'm trying to wrap my head into like the finances of farming and understanding the revenue generators do you have a clear what is your number one revenue generator like is it the agritourism is it is it selling strawberries or is it the wholesale uh landscaping business um Overall, for a full year, wholesale nursery is, is probably our number one okay. thing that we do. Like, just for that, the strawberry season is just such a short season. Mm-hmm. You know, the season's six to eight weeks long. Okay. I mean, during those six to eight weeks, strawberries are number one. It's That's what's driving us. But but it's a short season. So, right. Um, but, it, I mean, it's been it's proven to be good to be a diverse business like yeah. that because, like, in 2008, when we had a housing crisis sure. kind of uh the landscape side of things kind of went way down right. so we were really leaning on strawberries and agritourism field trips and stuff like that um so you know i mean that that's what i was thinking i have to imagine that just seeing the the growth of homes and like i mentioned earlier the amount of people that are moving to this area and i hear all the time about johnson county because johnson county because it's right there uh everybody wants to make their home and they're making it nice and especially in these last two years of covid when you're not traveling you have more money you have more disposable income to put into your home a la landscaping and things like that Mm -hmm. what's uh so back to that back to that question like what's the what's the number number one driver in the landscaping things like what what kind of plant should i be planting at my house well i don't know i mean we that, have to ask your brother <laughs> <Nick Coleman. laughs> yeah i mean there's depends on what you want there's a lot of different ways you can go with your uh landscape there but grow some wine matt you know plant some grapes yeah uh do do you have do you have that like cuttings for vitis vinifera that you could plant or is that um, the, specialized? The only things that we really we'll get in we don't grow a lot of grapes or anything like that. We'll buy in some muscadines that kind of uh, grow naturally here. Mm-hmm. You know, um, yeah. we'll buy some of those in to have at our garden center, but that's not something that we typically grow and keep on the farm. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's weird. Like you do. I mean, I assume that you're reactive to what you're what your land is telling you as far as like what you grow. I mean, it's one thing to say like, I want to do this, but it's like, but where you're at wants to do this. Is that kind of like, have you, have you kind of experimented with what are the best things to grow in your, in your area? And that's what you effectively choose to grow. 
Uh, well, on the, on the nursery side of things, when you're putting something in a pot, you can kind of control. You can do whatever, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, it's more determinate about your temperature range, you know, what grows in this area. You wouldn't want to grow tropicals or citrus or something, you know, mm-hmm. because that's going to die in the winter. Um, so, you know, that would be the limiting factor would be our climate as far as the nursery. And, and you're going to go with whatever the... Um, you know, what landscapers are wanting, what architects are drawing up, you know, mm-hmm. what's in demand, what garden centers want. Um, there's some bread and butter plants, like foundation plants that kind of are staples that you grow every year. And then there might be proven winners or something that comes out that you want to try a few of that might get more retail sales or something. Uh, when it comes to the produce side of things, yeah, I mean, it depends on your soils and how much land you have and all those kind of things. If you need to irrigate something, if you have a pond or, or how you can do that. Um, and you know, we grow the tomatoes and cucumbers and lettuce and stuff in the greenhouse. And by doing that, we can, those greenhouses are sitting on kind of some red clay that wouldn't be good for growing anything. And we put them in grow bags that are, uh, coconut core is what's inside the bags. And then we fertilize with what we, what the plant needs. So you said coconut core, coconut core. Yeah. It's like the outside of a coconut husk, you know, okay. the, yeah. the, that kind of shavings, you know, okay. that it's has no nutritional value at all to the plant. It's just really there to hold water and, and keep the moisture level right. And, I see. And so we dose the plant with how much water and, and mm-hmm. exactly what fertilizers they need. So, you know, that's a way to get around some of what you were talking about, your limitations for what your soils and, and yeah. stuff like that can do. Um, like on that particular part of our farm, we couldn't really grow anything, and now we're able to grow tomatoes and cucumbers and stuff like that. Just speaking about Johnston County kind of uh, overall, because Matt's talking about the development of it too, uh, how wh- what's your opinion of like seeing like this change? There's been rapid change happening there. Like I know that we're planning to open up a, a, a crafting out there in Clayton, and I'm seeing it just blow up. We had Chef Scott Crawford in here recently, and he's got Crawford Cook Shop. You got the Cardinal Bar opening up out there. You've got so much development. What's uh, how do you feel about all this development? I mean, I think it's exciting. I think there. I mean, there's positives and negatives to everything. Growing up. I'm, there was, I felt like it was a little bit boring. There wasn't a lot to do, you know, <laughs> right. as you kind of crave for s- some stuff like that. So the negative, I guess, as I get older is um, traffic and, and whatnot. But, uh, but I, I mean, I think it's good. It presents opportunities. Um, and you get a lot of different people with different ideas that have come from other areas. I think all that stuff's great. Um, yeah, I you, was the uh, a-hole that wrote that article in Raleigh Magazine about uh, watch out for the carpetbaggers coming to town because we had a lot of like you know local chefs or like celebrity chefs that were opening up places out here, and it's like it's going to be cool when they're, they're all here and they're making this great food. But then be careful, uh, prices are going to go up, parking spots are going to go yeah. away, uh, the traffic's going to get crazy, and then of course the real estate, all that stuff, and all that happened. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, the pandemic just kind of shut everything down again. But it's still happening. It's just, oh, and now it's just, very much happening. Yeah, like it's all ramped back up again. And because I think uh, last week, and we were recording this in uh, March twenty second, but last yeah, Duke week Duke is still alive right now. <laughs> as we're talking. Yeah, I think annuancy. I think s- there was something about uh, a bunch of big corporate offices, or maybe even the. Uh, uh, the state building here mm-hmm. with people coming back to the office and oh, you could yeah. just see it. I mean, I remember on my commutes that day, I was like, what is going on? And then trying to park at certain places. Yeah. It was, it was, it the was town crazy. Has been reactivated. Yeah. But, uh, but, but so then that's now kind of happening to the, the smaller towns, your township, if you will, getting back to the beginning is now those that were here in the downtown rally are like pushing out to the outskirts. But I mean, I'm noticing it in Nightdale, that you know, we get a lot of people that are thankful that we we're out here and we're out giving all this extra selection of craft cocktails and a, and a cool coffee shop and all these different kitchens that are back there. And people are like, "Thank you, thank you for doing this." At the same time, some people are like, mm, "These prices are a little expensive over here." And it's like, "Well, yeah, but we also are kind of giving you a premium product." And so there's a little good with the bad. It's like, yeah, we're we're trying to bring the thing that would normally have been in like the downtown area to you and come out here. But it also that comes with the cost. We're not, we're not Bojangles, you know. We're not going to be the thing that was already there. We're trying to be something that is unique. So that, yeah, there's a good and a bad. Development's happening, but you can't get away from it. But you just got to embrace it. I always just like to say though, remember the thing that you like about that town is 
is like why you like that town. So don't don't lose sight of that thing. You know, everyone's like chasing it. It's like I left L.A. because it got to be so crazy and like claustrophobic and this and this and that. I don't want to be the reason the virus that creates an L.A. in Raleigh. You know, like like am I the problem? <laughs> like I don't want that to happen. I want I like Raleigh because of what Raleigh is. You know, right? I think like going back to what you said about Lexington barbecue. You know, I mean, like you don't want to forget your identity. Yeah. Um, so I mean, there's a mix of like it's great to have growth and new ideas and new things and new options. But you also don't want to lose your identity in the process. So I mean, I, and I guess that's kind of what Joko Grows is about too. Is is that's telling everybody what our identity is, who we are, who we've been in Johnston County, and and what's around you. I think that's perfect. What a what an excellent way to wrap it up. Yeah. We uh, before we get out of here though, we do want to make sure that you're taken care of in a sense of dairy, liquor, <laughs> sugar. Yeah. All in one pint. I'm talking about proof alcohol ice cream, which, uh, do you like those things? Do you like dairy, sugar, and alcohol? I do, yeah. <laughs> what if yeah. they were all in one pint size package that was frozen in the form of ice cream with liquor in it? Because that's what we're going to send you home with from Proof Alcohol Ice Cream, one of our fantastic sponsors here that uh, originally comes out of Southern, uh, South Carolina. In Columbia, 7% ABV in every pint. You can get delicious flavors like a coconut rum or a bourbon caramel or a strawberry moonshine that maybe could have been possibly grown from your farm. Check them out. They're in these red branded freezers all over the state. You can go into Harris Teeter. You can go into Lowe's grocery stores or preferably Triangle Wine Company. Yeah. Triangle Wine Company is another great friend of uh, the show here. And so they're not quite out in Johnston County yet, but they are in Holly Springs. They're in uh, the very North Raleigh on the edge of Wake Forest there in the Bedford community. And then uh, their flagship in, in, in Cary at the Waverly Place. But they are uh, a great local option for all of your wine, vermouth, and beer needs. They have great tap rooms in there. And uh, for all NCF and B listeners, they offer a nice discount. If you just simply mention our name, they'll be like, yes, you get the NCFB uh, bump? debump, I guess, of your yeah. check. Reduction. It's reduction. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so go to, you can go online as well, trianglewineco.com and use the NCFB promo code. And lastly, because it's coming, it's coming yep. like a, a fireball being shot out of a cannon. It's crazy. We're talking about the second annual Bubbles and Brisket. And Chris, I want to invite you and your family to come out as well because... What better way to spend a Saturday, specifically June 4th, from 2 to 6, with champagne, beer, music, and brisket? I think we have about 10 different uh, chefs that are going to make their own version of brisket. It could be smoked, it could be baked, it could be on tacos, it could be on a pizza. It's going to be so many different ways, plus a side dish that they're all doing. We have people like Jake Wood, Matt Register... Brandon Shepard, Longleaf Swine. Nick, James Sampson. I think Nick Danf just walked in this place right now. He might even hear us. We have these fantastic folks that are all going to be a part of it. Come check us out. We're going to be at Smoky Hollow, which is in the center of downtown Raleigh. Yeah, there's going to be nothing like this. I mean, this is, you walk in, it's a ticketed event, and once you're in, it is all for you. You get as much as you want, as little as you want. There's a bar with 20 different sparkling wines. There'll be some of our great beer purveyors. And you can just walk and eat and drink and eat and drink and drink and eat. And it's just, (laughs) it's really magnificent. So, yeah. Chris, thank you so much. Johnston County, thank you so much for highlighting and letting us highlight Johnston County and what it means to be out there. For those that want to do a day trip and check out uh, the nursery and the farm, how how do we go about doing that? Well, you can find us on uh, Instagram, on Facebook. We have a website, smithsnurseryinc.com. Uh, on Facebook, you can search us as Smith's Nursery or uh, Smith's Farm Market. That sounds great. Come bring, check us out. On, bring the kids, kid-friendly, yeah. I assume? Yeah, absolutely kid-friendly. we got animals that kids can come feed. we got a cow, a donkey, horse, some pigs, goats, <laughs> awesome. and stuff like that. Kids like doing that kind of stuff. And probably in about two or three weeks, we'll have some strawberries that you can come pick. Then in the summer, we'll have blueberries, so there's always something to do. In the fall, we do hay rods and pumpkins. Uh, you mentioned Nick Damp. I think that's Damp Barbecue, right? That's right. Yeah, he's coming out. Like, this spring, they're here every other weekend, I think, doing a food truck. So, um, Fantastic. Weekends are a good time to come. He's the best 
kept secret about barbecue in this state. You're all going to know about him soon. Yeah. He's crushing it, man. Yeah. Well, Chris, thank you so much. And for all of you out there, go to Smith's Nursery. You will eat, drink, plant, play very merrily. Thanks for listening to the NCF&B Podcast. And if you've stuck with us this long, review us on iTunes and remember, five stars are encouraged.